Hi, thank you for joining us. Um, so we're just waiting for people to, to enter the Zoom. We're all used to it by now, but thanks so much for, for buying a ticket to this program and coming out to support the authors. And we'll get started in just a moment. All the people who aren't logged in yet will miss the song. Hey, welcome to the Zoom, it's happening. Get into the Zoom. Oh, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> extra bonus content <laughs> it's yeah. just something horrible just for you <laughs> I can't see that small Bad eyesight. yeah I think we'll just give it just just another minute or two and then we'll start looks like uh Quite a few people are here already. Thanks for joining us. Book's been out for a couple days, so if you haven't seen it yet, this is what it looks like. <laughs> Amber, is this here the same sweater? <gasps> it is! Oh! <laughs> <laughs> So we know it wasn't digital. Digital it wasn't a digital sweater. We had an author the other evening who felt like he could not wear his his suit that he wore in his author photo at all, um, because because he was just really really uncomfortable about it but I think it's fine so I think it's because it, it's a yeah. nice to do so I thought wow I it was on zoom. for he zoom yeah. yeah so he had another he had another suit um um yeah he had another suit and he wore that one instead uh, so Okay, I think I'm going to start the program because um, quite a few people are here. Um, so thank you for joining us for tonight's program with Amber Ruffin and Lacey Lamar. I'm Karen Maeda Allman, Author Events Co-Coordinator at the Elliott Bay Book Company. And tonight's program is presented by Elliott Bay with promotional support from our partners at the Northwest African American Museum. Though currently closed for in-person visits, NOM's ongoing programs include virtual author events, online exhibits, interactive story times, and a virtual King Day 2021 program on the NOM YouTube channel. A portion of the ticket proceeds from tonight's program will be donated to NOM. So when Grand Central Publishing sent us a co an advanced copy of Lacey and Amber's book, You'll never believe what happened to Lacey, crazy stories about racism. We knew right away that we wanted to do an event with the authors. Yes, this book is funny, but it's also an intervention. When I read this book, I knew that I wanted everyone to read it. I've experienced some of the situations portrayed in this book, but as an Asian American, I have witnessed far more of it because I am not black. Yes, these situations are sometimes funny as portrayed in this book, but they're also sad, infuriating, and not as rare as you think. You are in this book, either as a Lacey or an Amber, or as someone who is saying or doing these things, or as a bystander, or maybe all three. It's time to speak up if you haven't and show up for each other. Even though you know that the aftermath night might not be pretty at first, your workplace, school, neighborhood, and family will be better when you do. Maybe the best part is that millions of people will read this book and think, I am not crazy. You are not crazy. If you haven't already ordered a copy of the book and, and would like to, um, and if you haven't already purchased one when you register it, I hope you will. And we'll be sending out signed book plates with copies ordered from us at Elliott Bay. So thank you to Lacey and Amber for signing. So tonight we're honored to present the book's authors. Now we're writer and performer on Late Night with Seth, Seth Myers and host of the Amber Ruffin Show on the Peacock Network. Amber Ruffin lives in New York where she is no one's first black friend and everyone is, as she puts it, stark raving normal. 
She was the first black woman to write for a late night talk show in American history when she joined late night in 2014. Lacey Lamar is Amber Ruffin's big sister. She has worked in the healthcare and human service field for more than 25 years, 13 of those working with troubled youth in her community. She volunteers her time and resources to black, brown, refugees, and indigenous fellow humans in any way she can. She lives in Nebraska with her unbelievable, amazing daughter, Imani, and their 130 pound great Dane, Izzy. But right now I think she is sheltering uh, with Amber. They'll Where appear in conversation uh, with the Seattle writer, Naomi Ishisaka, assistant managing editor for diversity, inclusion and staff development and social justice columnist at the Seattle Times. As a journalist, editor and photographer, she focuses on racial equality and social justice. So welcome Amber Ruffin, Lacey Lamar and Naomi Ishisaka to the Seattle virtual stage. Thanks so much, Karen. <clears throat> Thanks so much. That was a great intro and um, touched on a lot of the really important uh, things about the book, which um, I'll just say I, I loved. I, you know, it's, it's incredibly funny. And, you know, a lot of times I write, I write a column, a weekly column of, that focuses a large part about race and I don't think funny is ever a word that anyone would use to describe my writing. So I'm really kind of in awe and envy of the ability to take really, really tough subject matter, but also make it funny. Um, so, you know, I guess kind of want to start with that. Um, you know, in the book, you, you said you use comedy to survive. And, and I guess I just want to, you to talk about that a little bit more. Like, what is the role of humor? Why, why humor versus, you know, the, <laughs> the more um, dry and serious stuff, say, that I would write, for example? Um, well, these things are funny. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, they're, each thing that happened is funny in its own way. And it's always about, like, where you are where in life and like physically and stuff when it happens like if it's the billionth thing that's happened to you it's hilarious if it's you know the first like oh you clutch your pearls but the millionth time you're like yeah and that's just how amber and i everyone in our family member tells any story we have to be funny about it. it's just what it is if someone falls down if someone went to the grocery store and something's like we will make a joke out of it and crack up. Sometimes we even make a song about it and sing about it. That's just who we are. And we gave you the humorous stories. I mean, we had stories that Amber was like, yeah, we can't put that in here. <laughs> Huge downer, we're not gonna tell it. Yeah. So we told the ones that you could secretly like giggle at or out loud laugh and giggle at. But that's also just who we are. We tell 8 billion jokes a day and just crack up. And maybe there's something in the version, but we like to laugh. Okay. That's the whole the whole family, including your parents. The whole too? family tries to get their jokes in. <laughs> so you were kind of raised with that that part of your family culture. Then it sounds like. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think most black people were. <laughs> Otherwise, I don't know how anyone survives. Yeah. You better be laughing about it. If you're not, you have a sad life, and I'm sorry. And yeah. I'm not either way. <laughs> Yeah. And so how, how, in terms of the, the humor of it, you know, you said you left some, some of the stories out because they were just too dark to be funny. Is that mm -hmm. you, you couldn't really get the absurdity of it because it was just too straight bleak. Yes. Some things are just horrible. Amber was in charge of, I would, I had all my stories written down. I had a lot of stories. I kept a journal. Um, and that's how a lot of our stories got into the book. I would always keep a log uh, at work of racist events that happened to me. When you have to go to HR and plead your case and tell them, this happened to me, I write down everything. I, every meeting I'm in, I grab my journal and I sit there and I take notes. And you wouldn't believe the stuff that people are saying. And I'm just, okay, I just said that. And I'm writing it down. Or if I'm even on a one-on-one -on -one meeting with someone and they're saying something very bizarre, racist to me, I'll write it down as, I've even had people say, what are you writing? And I'll say, what you're saying. <laughs> Just so, and that still doesn't check them. They'll still say, 
horrible things, but that's how I did it. So when it was time to write the book, I pulled out all these journals that I had and that's where a lot of the workplace stories uh, came from. I know the book's only been out for a couple of days, but I'm really curious, has, has any, have any of the people that you've written about in not such a good way, like reached out and been like, oh shit, that was me. Amber, <laughs> what just happened two seconds ago before we got on the Zoom call? Just now, uh, one of the women in the book texted Lacey. This lady has not called Lacey since Lacey left this job. No. More, much more than a year ago? Yeah, maybe a year ago. And and they weren't friends then. They were just coworkers. And she texted, congratulations on, or left a message. Left a voicemail. Wish I could play it. Uh, left a message. Congratulations, I you know, on your book. I'm going to be buying it soon. You're in it. You're in a lot of it. Go ahead. <laughs> Welcome her. Read the book. And now we've been saying this the whole time. Oh my gosh, people are going to read this book and know it's them. They may not even, it might not even register. What they've said to me, they might not even remember because they're constantly saying racist, idiotic things. So it may not even register in her mind. Did I say that? I mean, I know some people definitely will know, but some people might not have a clue. So that's interesting. Yeah, I'm dying to know in like six months, like how many of those texts and emails and calls you get from people who, well, hopefully, hopefully recognize themselves in it versus not, but you never know. That is so funny. So she hadn't read it yet. She was just- No, I saw her thinking, oh my gosh, she has the book and here it comes. Nope. She goes, oh, I'm just so excited to read your book. You really shouldn't be, but I mean, you. and I really, I want them to read the book because I think once they read it, hopefully it might be like, oh my gosh, I'm an idiot. I need to change my ways and yeah. tell five more people that act like this to change. But I'm, I mean, could be wishful thinking. Well, and that kind of, one of the questions I want to ask was, you know, I was really struck in reading the book about how much time, Lacey, you spend in your jobs in particular just educating people. Like there's often like, I had to go back and tell them exactly about themselves and what they did, just did and why it's wrong. And, you know, you spend su super large portion of your job educating other people. And do you ever just kind of think, well, you know, I'm just gonna leave them to their own ignorance yeah. or? Yeah, yeah, sometimes, I mean, at this point, a lot of the times I say, I can't, I'm done educating people. You either know or you don't. And yeah, it's, it's, it gets tiring. And I feel like it's 2021, you should know how to act by now. You should know, you should have heard it all. I shouldn't have to explain this to you. Mm -hmm. So I call it dragging white people into the light and I don't do it. I'm not doing it. <laughs> Amber <laughs> definitely does not. I'm not doing it. <laughs> she has no. Yeah, I'm figuring it out. Okay, mm -hmm. I have, I, I just, it doesn't, I, I feel like I'm kind of being a snob because if it affected me, I guess I would take the time. Amber is not <coughs> working shoulder to shoulder with a racist white woman that I have to have a meeting with every day. No. So I get it while she's like, I'm not doing that. No. <laughs> it's not. But if I have to meet with you every day and every day you say colored gal, we gotta, I gotta take you aside and just give you a small history lesson on why you shouldn't because I know you're not gonna get fired. I know if I go the next step and say, oh my gosh, Sally called me colored gal. They're gonna be like, oh, well, I think that's charming. And then I gotta educate, you know, it just keeps, it's ongoing. So you've gotta to have to put the kibosh on it and say, stop, stop. Yeah, well, and that was the other thing that struck me was just kind of the accumulated impact of, you know, it, it, the whole book is basically like the drip, drip, drip of these daily, racist incidents these daily indignities these daily disrespects like all these things and and i mean you know I'm, i guess i'm just wondering like what what do you think folks don't understand about the impact of that sort of drip 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 of just grind the grinding of the racism just ongoing just exactly what you said they don't understand it they don't know that every time they're saying something that i've heard it a hundred million times <laughs> You know, they don't understand. Sometimes they're trying to be clever or, to, or they know it's slightly racist, but they, they just think it's like this funny joke. Slightly racist is not a thing in schools. But, you know, they just think it's just a little bit, you know, edgy. And I think it's going to be funny. And Lacey's going to think it's funny. No. So, yeah, it's trying. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's just hard. It's, it, it's hard to try to educate folks. 
but you kind of do that too in your in your in your work too amber with your shows um you know weaving some of that in you don't have to do it necessarily like one-on-one -on -one, but you're really doing a lot of that education in your in your work as well sure a little bit a lot of it is an accident i mostly just I, I i set out to affirm the way you are feeling and if someone gets educated that's a nice byproduct but rarely am i like you gotta do this and stop blah, blah. you know i'm more like look these people are crazy it's you and me here we can do this these people are nuts you have to stay safe you know that's usually where i'm coming from i don't know i, I gotta look back that might not be true but i feel like it is <laughs> Um, I just wanted to remind the audience that we have a Q&A and we'd love to get your questions in. So if you want to ask a question of Lacey and Amber, um, put your question into the, oh, look, one just popped up, um, into the Q&A box and we'll get to them toward the end of the program. So please keep those questions coming and we'll we'll sort them out and get to them to those closer to the end. Um, so, you know, getting a little bit more on the serious side, um, you know, the, as I said, the book is really funny and, and there's a lot of like <laughs> um, absurdity to a lot of the stories. But there, but the real life impacts of some of them, um, you know, you can kind of see like how it could set set a course in a in a young person's life in particular, you know, I'm thinking about the story about, you know, the math class and the story about the drama class and the school election, you know, all those things like really um, squashed some of your your dreams, Lacey, and some of your um, ambitions in a way that, you know, happened when you were a child. So, you know, can you talk about that experience and just, you know, how you how you took those experiences and um, you know, it sounded like you kind of, I don't know, maybe just talk about some of those experiences and the impacts it had on you and, and the course that you, you ended up on in, in your life. Yeah, so um, I've had lots of bad uh, school experiences, but when they happen to you at such a young age, I hate to say this, but you kind of expect it. So after a while, you walk into a classroom and you're just thinking, this teacher's not going to like me. I'm going to just try to be as charming as possible. I was never like uh, labeled the bad kid. I was always the super geek. So I kind of won my teachers over that way, but uh, I shouldn't say won my teachers over. But they, um, I still expected to be treated badly. And I know that sounds bad. And I know back then, uh, all the black kids at my school expected that. Like we knew, okay, this teacher's this way, this teacher's this way. I'm gonna walk in, they're gonna think I'm a troublemaker. It's just, it follows you everywhere. It's a bad feeling to have, but it follows you everywhere. It's not just school. And so you have to just have your own self-esteem. So when I would walk through yes. school, I had my favorite t-shirt. People, people don't really remember my name, but they'll say, you're the girl that always had that t-shirt on the front it said racism is an illness mm -hmm. and on the back it said are you sick and i wore that all the time and so people be like you're that girl that had the racism yes i am so you walk in i just had this air of um i'm the best because that's what my parents taught us to so if i didn't have that background of my mom and dad telling me you are absolutely fabulous you're wonderful maybe it would have weighed me down but i had a lot of friends that's what you do. You're, you raise a black child and you tell them you are excellent. You are wonderful. And white people are going to try to pull you down all the time. Don't let them do it. So it makes you stronger. You walk into a classroom and you're like, this teacher is just going to be absolutely horrible. Um, mom said, um, you are the smartest. You're the smartest child. And any child in your class who thinks they're smarter than you is mistaken. And it's okay to expect that from them because they're not as smart as you. They're easily, they're easily. My mom made us believe that we were like rocket science all really the time. Did. She really did. Yeah. So she said that to each of you, or oh yeah, she let us all know that she we said were that amazing. She, she, she no, I'm did. Just kidding. Yeah, she did. <laughs> <laughs> but she, she also did. like. I feel like a lot of people, you know, now that we put all these stories in this book and you look back at it, I always think about people who say, "Oh my gosh, I love." My teacher, so and so, and so, oh, I just loved her. I'm like, I don't have that. I don't Do have, have that? that. No, no, I don't have. I have 
maybe one teacher uh, in elementary school, Mrs. Decker. Oh my she God, was she was wonderful. I loved her. She just was always like, you can do it. This is but isn't that weird that I got one? I have one teacher. The rest of my elementary school teachers, mm -mm. No, 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 absolutely horrible. And there's a million little black children in school right now talking about school would be fun if it wasn't for Mrs. Smith. Oh, well, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you just have to live like that. And we're us. We are fun, smart as hell, and cute to shit. And then <laughs> what if you weren't? What if any one of those was gone? What uh, what kind of life would we have? How horrible would elementary school have been? Probably quite. Do you think, you know, Lacey, do you think that because you work with youth? You, you've spent a lot of time working with young people. Have you, have you ex seen that things have changed for them in Omaha or do you think it's pretty much like it was when you were coming up? Um, I have a 19 year old daughter and it's drastically different. You can speak up in school now and not get in trouble. You can start a, a, what do you call, a protest. My daughter, and my daughter is, she has that nerdy thing like I do. So she, she calls me one time I was at work. She goes, mom, I'm not really asking, but I'm telling there is a walkout against racism and we are walking out of the school at 10. And if I get in trouble, they're going to call you. I said, go right ahead. <laughs> I probably would not have done that. We would have, and my parents may have been like, you're going to get in trouble for walking out of school. Uh, but I was so proud. I was telling everybody, my, mom, my daughter's walking out of the school at 10 o'clock with a walk for racism. I thought it was the best thing ever. So I think kids now are just emboldened. They'll speak out and say anything. And I think that's great, but not de definitely not like we were when we were young. Has your daughter though had had teachers that were like, could, yes. would she say she had more than one teacher she liked? Yep. Oh, more than one oh, teacher like. she liked? Yes, yes, I definitely would say that. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's, so it's, it's very different. The things that are said now, I'd make sure someone goes to jail if they said that to a child. So she has not said, she has not had those things happen. She's had some teachers that, have crossed the line and have said something and everyone uh, signs a paper to get that teacher outed or they go and they protest about it or they go to the principal. Like they will tell on teachers now. They're saying you can't get away. I mean, I'm not saying you can't or you need to stop, but it's harder to get away it's with harder. just being blatant racism right now mm -hmm. in school, I feel. Um, looks like we've got a um, bunch of, oh, a bunch of questions coming in. That's great. Um, um, I did want to ask you, um, you know, I, I was I, in, in places like Seattle, I think we had this misperception and probably true in places like New York too, that, you know, racism and these kind of racist incidents that I read about in this book, um, yeah, of course that kind of thing would happen in Nebraska. You know, of course that kind of thing would happen in the South, but that kind of thing doesn't happen in Seattle or New York. And I guess I'm just wondering like, and maybe this is a question for, for you, Amber, since you live in New York all the time, um, you know, what, what are some of the misperceptions people have about, about a, a place like Nebraska versus a place like New York and, and some of the differences? None. Everything they think is correct. New York is great. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you compare um, living in New York to Nebraska, it does not compare. It's fantastic here. But also, I am saying that as a person with like a nice job and people who would get booted if they said anything crazy, you know, you wouldn't just get fired. Your career would be done. <laughs> so I guess I am a bad measure, but it is so much more like I can go to the store and I get followed around. I haven't been followed around in a billion years. That's not true. Every once in a while we'll get in the car and go drive around and when you go to like a small city mall then you will get followed around yeah. But um here oh like one of the worst places in the world is JC Penny <laughs> as far as like I was just thinking you know, about JC Penny. I was <laughs> They'll follow you around real bad, especially if you're lazy. Mm -hmm. And here it, in Manhattan, what? I didn't there's know a there was a JCPenney's here. It might be bankrupt. Something happened to JCPenney. Something happened to JCPenney. 
not quite their comeuppance, but something. Um, and I went to that JC Penny and I just, I needed a dress so bad. And I was like, I just have to run in. I only have a half hour. I got to go in and get a dress. No one cared that I was in there. And I saw loss prevention. We know them enough. We to know. Them I can by smell loss, loss prevention. prevention. I know who they are. I know what they look like. So I'm looking at this guy he doesn't and he doesn't care. He does not care. So I was telling my story. When I got here, we went to the store and I had this big purse and I was afraid to dig in it too many times because in Omaha, you dig in your purse, you're stealing and you will get someone will someone's already following you but then they might be like what what are you doing so i'm in the store in new york and i'm like and then i'm like no one cares no one's looking at me there's a ton of black people everywhere they don't care and i felt like this weight was like oh my gosh i can just like walk around the store (laughs) and nobody's really caring that i'm there and there's black people everywhere so you know yeah it works been great for me I'm free, skipping. <laughs> yeah. If well, you I think had a normal workplace here, I don't know. But at my workplace, at these little stores, it's heaven. Yeah, I mean, and one of the questions that um, I'll ask in a little bit, I mean, kind of speaks to this question around, you know, places like and maybe, maybe more Seattle than New York, but we definitely have like a more subtle kind of polite form of racism that... I think f- people find very um, frustrating because it actually, a lot of it, we couldn't really tell a story about it in the way that you did in this book because it's a lot more subtle. And so then it's harder to pinpoint or it's more systemic or more structural and it's harder to kind of like, you know, talk about in a way that people kind of like can resonate with. So maybe that's a another book for another time, but. <laughs> um, so I guess I'm going to start asking some of the questions that come in because we we have quite a few, um, and I'm going to skip some of the more specific ones for now. Um, but um, the first one I want to ask was: sometimes people say they try to negate racism, saying with by saying things like "but I have black friends" or "I think they were just trying to be nice and make conversation." Um, are there any racist stories you excluded because it was so subtle or nuanced that you didn't think people would understand? No, I mean, maybe, I doubt it. I think we were gunning for whatever the funniest is, but also I don't know how subtle the Nebraska stories are. (laughs) <laughs> there yeah. is, I mean, there aren't a lot of stories. And also terribly, you know how Lacey was saying that Imani, you know, puts up with a lot less than she did. And, you know, our parents put up with a lot more than we do. And I think because of that, we are now 24. No, I'm just kidding. We are now of an age where it has to be kind of unacceptable to even really for it to really register as like hey you know you really got to put your foot in it when you're talking to me I'm from Omaha Nebraska if you say something racist it's got to be pretty good for me to be like oh I got to remember this and write it down in a book and I think like I on the Amber Ruffin show I have a lot of young black writers and they'll be saying things like this person who asked this question is talking about. And I will say things like, oh, and they said that to you and you just said out loud, don't talk to me like that. Oh, okay, all right, yeah, okay, the world is changing. So I do think that subtle racism, I mean, it's crazy and it exists and it's everywhere, but I mean, in Nebraska, you gotta come harder than that. <laughs> that's funny um <laughs> um so this is a more specific question for you amber um this person says um they love your segments on seth myers and your and they love your show and they want to know how nbc and the writers room supports your ideas or if you have to work harder or defend your creative 
to get it on the screen. No, <laughs> these people let me run wild and I am not exaggerating. There isn't a thing where, and I remember when I would pitch things and be like, this is going too far. But once they let me say something like, I've never met a cop I like, something along those lines, and they let me just say it, I was like, oh, we can do whatever we want here. And they really are like interested in what, how do you feel? And I usually, things are structured like, this is how I feel instead of these are the facts. So you can really, I mean, I maybe shouldn't be saying all cops are bad, but I can say I've never met a cop I like. You know, I can say that. It's, it's true. Although that's not true. My friend's dad was a cop. He was nice. <laughs> that is just one. He's alone. <laughs> Um, can you, can you, I'm curious about this too. Can you talk about what it was like to write the book together as friends and sisters? Um, and they, they said it sounds fun, but also maybe difficult. It was just like this. We sat around and we, <laughs> we drank and we laughed. We wrote a lot of it on my parents' couch. Every once in a while, my dad would come down and be like, what? are you talking about <laughs> where word might slip out you cannot swear at my parents huh? i didn't swear um them. she swore a lot i've never swore. um so it was a lot of fun amber oh, i don't want to say this this will make her feel better but she was the in charge she was the one that was like this story put your hand up <laughs> this story cannot we're not doing that so i would just throw out all these stories i got this i got this she'd be like no yes so no yes so so many. She's the writer, so she knows how it should flow. Obviously, she did an amazing job. So she was in charge of that, and I was the story supplier. I was like, I got this one. I got this one. I mean, so many. If yeah. we really had a million to choose from, and we wrote them all down on little, um, like you, like you're um, writing like a storyboard kind of. Yeah. But it was just all titles of stories, and it was like a million of them. And then we were so rich with stories. We'd be like, yes, no, yes, no, um, it, which was great and also quite terrible. Why terrible? Because these are things that really happened to us. Oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> terrible. Yeah. yeah. Lacey, were there any that you were like, oh, this one has to get in, but Amber was like. No, that's not going to be funny. No, we put in the funniest. The ones that I were like, okay, we're going to put this one in. It was probably not funny and it was too heavy. A downer. A down. And Amber would be like, no. A couple down. I knew the ones that people were going to laugh out loud and cry. And we had those ready. But the other ones, I was like, should we put this one in? And Amber's like, no. <laughs> um, and Lacey, have, have you ever thought about moving away from Nebraska to somewhere less actively racist? Everyone asks that and I just need to tell everyone that's worried about me. <laughs> my family still lives there. My mom and dad and I have brothers and sisters and my daughter. Everyone is still there. So there might be a slight chance I'd move away but right now I'm fine. I'm in this great community called Benson. Shout out to Benson. And that is a great uh, wonderful community. We have people that are trying to change the game. Uh, if you want to go to a rally, you can go to a rally if you want to protest it. So we're doing things in Omaha. So uh, Omaha is not just from the book, every horrible situation happened to me, that's happening to me constantly, but I do have a break. I have my own little great, uh, you know, friendship circle. So I'm doing great. There might be a slight chance. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> um... <clears throat> Oh, somebody asks me to mention that the audiobook is read by these marvelous women and it is fabulous. It's Yay! real loud. I it's mean, that. a good, a good adjective. <laughs> it's loud. <laughs> it's loud. By the book. Says the critics. <laughs> oh, it sounds so interesting. Oh, I like the volume of it. <laughs> Would, 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 would either of you be willing to share um, one of the stories that you feel is most absurd? 
there's so many, but. There's a lot. I mean, to me, the best story <laughs> is Lacey got black history checks. And so they each check would have a different black history hero on it. Um, and then one time she paid for something with the check and she handed it to the cashier and the girl takes the check and goes, I didn't know you could get pictures of yourself on your checks. Do a visual aid. Harriet Tubman. <laughs> yeah. So that one, that's my favorite. Yeah. Um, so, um, oh, and I should also say one of the things I loved about the book is that it's, it's text, but it also has photos and it has text messages and it has <laughs> a picture of a really cute um, cat as well. Um, Yay! <laughs> for a palette, I think it was called a racist palette cleanser or something. Yeah, Curtis, the um, palette cleansing duck. The duck. Yeah. Oh, duck, sorry, yes, thank you. Palette cleansing duck. Um, so there was a question about the publishing process. Um, when you pitch a book of stories about racism, um, were publishers like excited about that or were they like, ooh, I don't know, I don't know how that could be funny? They were excited about it. I was shocked. At each meeting we had, I would make us all take a picture and then I'd text it to Lacey. Tell them what happened. And then at one of the meetings, I get this text in the middle of the meeting and I just so happened to look at my phone during meeting. You guys don't do that. That's not nice, but I did. Because it's from Lacey. And we're all talking about Lacey. I know Lacey texted me just now. And then I was like, you guys are not going to believe this. And it was the text um, from when she uh, said, we all met our quota at work. Met our goal, met our goal at work. And um, most of the people who work here are Black. And almost all of the supervisors are white. And the supervisors got us a t-shirt. Um, to celebrate, and the T-shirt said, "Hashtag We Winning." And Lacey asked, "Why does it say We Winning?" And they said, "That's because that's how you talk." guys <laughs> talk. <laughs> and I was like, "Take a picture, send it to Amber." <laughs> that's how you guys talk. Who are you talking? Hashtag. Okay, hashtag we, we win. win. Yeah, okay. Great. That story was amazing. Yeah, that happened while we were talking to yeah. them. It's in the book. Yeah. Um, we can write this book and we have enough material coming in daily. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Are you thinking about taking the material that was left on the cutting room floor and doing a second book? It'll be called, you'll never believe what happened to Lacey. The sad one. <laughs> <laughs> Give me another year. I'll have another whole. That's true. <laughs> That's hilarious stories. That's true. Well, it'll be interesting it's to see. If, for me. <laughs> it'll be interesting to see if people watch themselves more around you, knowing what they know after reading it, that, you know, you're paying close attention and you're taking notes. We shall see. I have no faith in that whatsoever. <laughs> little clown 100%. Um, this one's going to take me just a second to read because it's very long. Um, okay, that one's it's too long. Um, do you think that the DEI training that a lot of workplaces are doing now um, actually helps in addressing racism? Okay. That is so sweet that you think people in Nebraska do that. <laughs> Don't. I've been to one place that had that training. No, I take that back. I've been to two places that had that training. One, they did the, how do I explain? They did the white privilege um, uh, exercise where they'll say, step forward if you've ever uh, or if you haven't been pulled over by the police and harassed, you know. So the white person always ends up in the front and the black people always end up in the back and then that's supposed to show you how white privilege goes. We did that two years in a row at one of my workplaces. Nobody got it. The white people said, we won, yes! All right, we beat 
hate you. And I had to explain to them, no, no, that's not a good, I, not the person that's presenting. I had to tell them, okay, guys, it's, a, it's showing you what, no, it's showing us that we are more respectful than you guys. And if you did this, then you wouldn't be pulled over by the police. Then you need to know how to act. So the second training that I had, you're going to love this. This was at my corporate job. Uh, everyone else skipped it. And I was the only one that showed up. So that's the only experience that I've ever had in any type of training. Nebraska does not believe in that. And they call it like reverse racism. I mean, I thought the fact that the so many of the um, the villains were HR people who were supposedly in the role to protect and <laughs> defend the That's stuff. all that's yeah. coming from inside the and house. I'm telling you, out of every place that I've ever worked, um, most of my black coworkers go, Lacey, why are you even going to HR? HR is not a positive thing. No. So it's like, we don't even go to HR. No, we just get angry or we quit. Or So I'm always like, oh, let me make my compliments and that'll change it. It never has. Um, I mean, sometimes it's, it's changed. I've, I've dealt with a couple good HR, but most of the time it's like, I will tell people, go to HR. The more we complain and they're like, no, I'm not even going to bother with that. That's ridiculous. Yeah, HR to me has never been anything positive or great. Yeah, and that's why people insist that insist on um, now it's not enough to have HR. You have to have an outside firm doing it. Yeah. And most of the time in Nebraska, HR is a lady the racist boss hired. Mm -hmm. And he made sure they felt the same. Mm -hmm. And then he hired her. From Shimity Dig, Nebraska, who and has never met a person of color. It's her job to make sure the place doesn't get sued. It's yeah. not her job to defend you. So HR is a joke. Um, so somebody writes um, that they watch all of your videos, Amber, to lift their spirits, um, and that they include your videos in her in their um, transportation policy work to defend the police, to defund the police. Um, and mm -hmm. says, she said, since I'm la labeled as the crazy um, T.O. Bernie lover versus the rest of my first generation Salvadoran American familia who love Trump, um, still wants to have conversations with her nieces and nephews on white privilege. Um, and they're wondering, I don't know why I think it's a she. Um, it's not a she. Would you recommend sending this book to my nieces and nephews to help lighten the conversation on racism, but to also hit the nail on the head about racism? And their family lives in Richmond, Virginia. Ooh, I know you want to do it in Richmond. Um, but it is a great way to, it's a great way in because it's a short, short trip from, oh my gosh, could you believe that was said? Yeah, that's crazy. Well, you know, if you think about it, the system's kind of set up that way. It's happened 50,000 times. Yeah, it just keeps happening. Taylor's all this time must be structural. <laughs> you know, like, it's a, it's, that is a really fun, I don't think I ever really gave that any thought. Um, that's a good idea. So yes, you had a good idea. <laughs> Yeah, because no. once they're laughing about, if you laugh, then you agree it's racist. If you agree it's racist, that racism has to come from somewhere. You know, that person didn't invent racism. <laughs> um, there's a question for you, Lacey, about your work in long-term care. Um, they're in Seattle and think, often think, what is this like in Omaha? Um, they're from St. Louis and got the hell out, they said, because long-term care is so damn institutionally racist. Um, so I think they're wondering about um, working in long-term care. I no longer work in that anymore, but yes, it, it's, it's always been extremely racist. It's always been lots of people of color, um, you know, uh, working as the CNAs, and it's always the, the white people that are the you know, the nurses, uh, the supervisors, and I just always happened to be, you know, one of the directors. And so I, I was always, that was the morning meetings that I was in listening to them 
talk about, oh my gosh, we hired this lady from Mexico and blah, blah, blah. And it's just like, what, what are you saying? <laughs> yes, I've always found every single place it, it, when I've worked in healthcare to be extremely, extremely racist. So I agree with them. I don't know how that, I don't know why that is. And I don't know how to change it. I am no longer there. I still will uh, talk to my friends that are, that work in those places and they're like oh absolutely nothing has changed <laughs> and I have I, I don't know when or how to change that but I agree with them totally um <clears throat> <for you. laughs> uh, another question for Amber um did you do theater and musicals in high school and how did you get into comedy I did do theater and musicals in high school I loved it and I still do um, I got into comedy because in Omaha there isn't a lot of theater and when there is it's kind of white so you know I did my best with it and then my friend Kelsey was like there is this improv troupe and we had done improv in high school so we learned it in drama class so I went and I joined his troupe then we would go to Chicago once a year for the Chicago Improv Festival. And there they were like, you have to move here. You have to do improv. You could really work and have like a full-time job. And so then I moved there and I did. They were right. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, <clears throat> so th there's a couple questions about books that you like, um, what your favorite books are that you're reading right now um and your favorite ever and if you have a favorite genre of books both of you okay so i was a huge nerd in school and i would carry around a lord of the rings <laughs> and i've read them all right now though i am reading uh black buck and that's like high up on the list i love that so that's what i mentioned now and reading i, I i'm listening to the audio but I think that is great. That's by uh, Mateo. I'm going to say his last name wrong, so I'm not. But if you Google Black Buck, it's amazing. Yeah. Oh, I don't read. <laughs> Can't. I don't know how. Um, I usually don't have a one free second to do anything. Um, but you know what books I have? I'm looking at our um, bookshelf and it's all of my books are workbooks because when we were young, we, um, ma mom and dad would go to the uh, book auction down the street and like you'd get a big box of books and you, you know, they would bid on it, but they'd be like Moby Dick and um, J Jane Austen, uh, like, uh, uh, you know, um, Dr. Seuss. And my parents would go, oh, okay, we'll bid on that. But that's just three books. And there's a whole tub of books and you get the whole tub. So like, it was a lot of like workbooks in those things. And it was like, and, and not like always workbooks, but sometimes like intro to sailing or like <laughs> um, textbooks from school. And like, uh, y y you know, like, language books on learning languages so like those were the books that i thought were interesting and i almost never used or used reading as fun i all almost only ever use it to give me information because mm -hmm. i do think it is fun to sit down and learn just a little bit of a nothing like i have like a japanese workbook you know <laughs> You know, and I don't speak Japanese, but it's fun to try to get a little bit of a handle on it and like intro to macrame. Okay, what is this exactly? You know, astrology. Okay, what what are the what are the rules? What are the basics of it? Like, I like to learn a little bit of everything. It feels good. Um. Yeah. I won't. I won't bring up the story in the book about about that. Um about the books that your parents picked up at the, <laughs> the book auction. I don't remember. I don't remember it either. What's there the story was, about the auction? It was, um, it was a story about 
about um, minstrel shows, I think. Oh! <laughs> Yeah. Figure that out with the information I have. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Both said, oh, oh yeah. yes, they did. Um, so, <laughs> um, we have a few more minutes, so I'm going to ask some of the more, um, more particular questions that, um, are interesting. You know, well, so the first one is. To you, Amber, on a scale of one to 10, how much fun was it to wear Billy Porter's hat because the clip gives me so much joy? So great. I couldn't believe it. I, now I went and I pitched this bit. I do a bit on Late Night with Seth Meyers called Amber Says What? And on it, uh, you know, I go, this happened. And I was all like, what? This happened. I was all like, what? This happened. I was all like, what? So then I thought it would be funny to have Billy Porter's hat. Um, once he wore a hat to the Met, that was like a big um, bolero head, is that mm -hmm. what it's called? Yeah. And it um, had fringe on the bottom and the fringe would, um, there was a mechanism on it that would shut the fringe and then open the fringe and it was so cool. It was a rhinestone <laughs> fringe, the fringiest of the fringes. So I thought, oh, our art department can just make such a hat. It doesn't have to look exactly like it. And they were like, it would be extremely hard for us to make that hat. Why don't we just get the hat? I thought, you can't possibly just get the hat. First of all, it has to be in LA, right? And they were like, yes, the lady who makes the hat is an LA lady. We're gonna fly her and the hat out. <laughs> they got two seats on the plane. <laughs> oh, they flew the hat out. So that I could tell jokes while wearing a sparkly hat, then it was the most fun. It is a thing I think about a lot, though. Whenever you go, is this too much? It wasn't too much to fly my hat out for 30 seconds of joy. So is anything too much? I don't think so. And then it has a whole life on its own on the internet forever. So. 30 yeah. seconds of joy is bringing years of, of enjoyment. Yeah. Um, okay, another another specific question. Um, will the Amber Ruffin Show drinking glasses ever be made available to the public? Everybody asks that and we're not allowed to say anything. But I feel like it's just <laughs> us. Um, <laughs> I just got an email saying that they're coming in a few so it's happening. Glasses, tote bags, end of list. <laughs> but I, I freaking love those glasses. I think they're beautiful. And I feel like almost every day someone tweets at me, when can I get some of those glasses? Yeah. And I want to say, soon it's coming and we're doing it. But I'm not allowed to say that. But here, I don't think anyone's going to tattle on me here. It's just us. No one say anything. No one say anything. <laughs> One of the perks of being part of this program, everyone, you got to keep it to yourself. Um, so kind of on a similar line, um, uh, this person says, Amber, your wardrobe is fantastic. And do all the bomber jackets you wear on Seth Meyers belong to you or NBC? Nothing belongs to me. I am wearing the same shirt I wore on the cover of the dang book. Amber's got two shirts and one <laughs> pair of pants. It's bad. I'm a bad little boy. I don't care what clothes I wear. I, I don't give a rip. But all of those clothes, it's funny because a lot of them are in this closet at NBC, but most of them get put in some place I don't have access to. But the big ass closet that is full of my clothes for work is much, much bigger and many, many more clothes than I own. I always go, it's true. Uh, how have I worn this many clothes when I come home to eight shirts and four <laughs> pair of pants? There's nothing. And here's There's nothing, nothing here, everyone. My, Lacey the other day was like, I need a shirt, just a button up shirt. I was like, I, I don't have that. <laughs> it's like, a button up shirt, I don't have it. I don't have anything. 
Amber, her whole life, can I talk, can I talk about you? Okay. It's not been a big shopper. Like she is not like, if I were in Amber's shoes, I wouldn't have a place to live because I would be living on a mound of clothes. She would. She You're in New problem. York. That's all. I mean, the shopping is wonderful. Amber has never, ever been that way. I mean, we like frilly cute things, but she's not like, I have 8 million things I bought at the sale. I don't like having things. I don't like things in my house. I like to have an empty house. She's a minimalist. I don't like, like the too much true stuff. minimalist. Only because I've moved around from city to city, from place to place since forever. Everything I own can still fit in two big old luggages. That's it. That's all I need. Wow. <laughs> um, well, that kind of leads into um, what was going to be one of my last questions, which was um, from Larissa asking what kind of self-care you both do. Sounds like yours is not shopping, Amber. No. I drink a lot. <laughs> I mean, I, oh, empty. I, I, I'm drinking now. I'm almost empty. Ooh, Naomi, we know that's vodka. Um, <laughs> no, I uh, will sit on this couch right here in this corner. That's where I am 1,000% of the time. If I'm not at my desk, I'm right here and I'm watching television and that is what I do with my little, tiny little bit of free time. All I want to do is find a show that I'm in love with and then watch the butt off of it. That's my favorite thing to do. Everything else <laughs> can fall. Oh, I used to like going out to eat was my favorite thing. That's dead. Going out to eat is dead. You gotta learn how to cook. I'm hungry. I'm so thin. <laughs> I have had to stop eating out. But I'm sitting on the couch watching TV. I don't know. I do feel like TV will turn off my brain because, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's got to be done. Like, we're sitting here talking. I have a lot of work I could be doing. <laughs> I, but, like, you know, you're always thinking that. The only thing that can turn that off is television for me. That's my self-care. What's your self-care? I like to go to the gym, and you know this. Lacey's a little gym dog. I joined the gym while I was here. She joined a gym while she's here. She ain't going to be here but a couple of weeks. She joined a whole gym and not a raggedy one. It's a beautiful gym. A fancy gym. It's worth moving here for. I love this gym. She keeps saying that. She might move here. She might move here because of the to gym. To work out at a gym. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can go to gyms in New York now? You can. You can. And so I was like, oh. Ooh, what about COVID? There's no, I, no I, it's, it's across from the place that I'm staying and it's empty every time I go. So it's your own gym. It's your own personal gym. Gross's gym. <laughs> That's wonderful. Um, uh, is there anything that I didn't ask you that you wanted to make sure to save? Yeah, we like you. And Yay. it's nice when people buy the book and it's weird to have a book and it's fun. <laughs> Give it to your most racist friend and relative. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Well, that yeah. was that was super fun. I'm gonna hand it back to Karen, but thank you so much. That was um, that was great. Thank you, Naomi. Can't thank wait you. for you to send me those earrings. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and thanks so much to Amber, to Lacey, and to Naomi. What a wonderful evening! And thanks to everyone who came. I posted some links in the chat, including one to the hat video. So if you haven't seen it. Um, so thanks so much and thanks for your support and good night. Stay safe out there. Bye. Bye. Bye.